Warhammer 40k lore in the Bible, where I pull from Warhammer 40k lore to help explain biblical lore. Today we're going to be going over the Tomb Worlds of the Necrons. But before we get into the video, take the wikis with a grain of salt, as some stuff has been retconned and all that. And also, I do a regular biblical video on Mondays. And also, the Warhammer 40k lore in the Bible series will be on Thursdays. But I got some future plans in the works. And the channel is probably going to be changing a little bit. You know, the Warhammer 40k lore series is still there. And the Mondays videos and stuff like that. But there's some plans coming, let's just say. I don't want to reveal them yet. As they're in the planning stages. But anyways. Um, there's going to be a new show coming. Hopefully pretty soon. But in the future. Anyways. Let's go ahead and get started. And it'll be Warhammer 40k lore. Around it and stuff like that. But anyways. A tomb world is one of the worlds across the Milky Way galaxy. Where the ancient and terrible Xenos, known as the Necrons, chose to go into hibernation over 60 million standard years ago, deep beneath its surface in their specially prepared catacombs and tombs. Many tomb worlds are now settled planets of the Imperium of Man, and their status as a Necron tomb or tomb world remains unknown until the Necrons beneath its surface begin to awaken. Much to the detriment of all life on the world, an unknown number of these planets exist across the galaxy in the 41st millennium. Some tomb worlds were once the settled worlds of the ancient Necrotier species that eventually became the cybernetic Necrons after their enslavement by the Catan, and Necrotier ruins are sometimes found on or beneath the surfaces of such worlds. Many Necron tomb worlds are now dead worlds largely lifeless and barren deserts. Whether this is the result of the Necrons having cleansed all life from the world millions of years before during one of their foul red harvests, or whether such climates were the preferred homeworlds of the Necrontier civilization, is unknown. Excuse me. Many of these worlds are often the sites of archaeological expeditions carried out by the Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator teams looking to uncover ancient Xenos or SDC technologies, or rogue trader expeditions hoping to turn a profit from what they discover. Many of these exploratory t or teams are never heard from again once they begin to explore Necrontier ruins that inevitably, or inevitably lead them to the tombs of the dormant Necrons that lie beneath the sands. The Necrons' underground tombs are generally quite large and um, cavernous, containing repair facilities that are manned by canoptic um, scarab robots that repair the Necrons that were critically damaged in recent battles. They have stasis units in which dormant Necrons hibernate. They also usually have a large room in which either the Necron Lord or Necron Overlord that commands the Tomb World, occasionally called Platinum Lord or Tomb Lord, sleep in a massive an ornate black stone sarcophagus. For many of the galaxy's myriad intelligent species, the re-emergent Necrons are but one terror amongst many in the darkness between the stars. Even within the Imperium of Man, the Necrons are only dimly understood, with just a handful of individuals aware of true scale of the threat they represent to mankind's dominion over the galaxy. Oops. Types of Tomb Worlds There is no such as a typical Necron Tomb World. Each answers only to the will of its noble ruler, and thus his proclivities define everything from its grand campaigns to trivialities such as architectural styles and forms of address between noble ranks. Nevertheless, there is one common cause that binds all Tomb Worlds, the rebuilding of the Necron dynasties of old, and the return of the Necrons to their rightful place of supremacy over the whole of the ignorant galaxy. The tomb worlds listed below represent no more than a handful of the millions spread throughout the galaxy. Each, or each revived world has its own 
idiosyncrasies, and the number is ever-growing. Who can say how many far-flung outposts of humanity have their foundation set upon a planet long ago claimed by an immeasurably older civilization, its inhabitants blissfully unaware of the slumbering horror at their planet's core? In these days of the Necron's awakening, no world in the galaxy could truly rest easy. So we got the crown worlds. Just as the Necron society is rigidly hierarchical, so too are the tomb worlds. The most important are the crown worlds, oldest and proudest of all the Necron hell planets, and the sites from which their dynasties and planetary clusters are governed. Crown worlds were once hubs of galactic power in the ancient days of Necron might. Buttressed by the tithe and tribute sent from elsewhere within the territory of their ruling dynasties. Oops. Okay, um, with access to such great resource wealth, crown worlds were able to construct the most reliable stasis crypts for their inhabitants. As a result, crown world inhabit or inhabitants that have withered the slumbering millennia without fouling afoul of their external circumstances, have done so excellent or in excellent condition, though this only dampens the tragedy for the Necron race when a crown world is lost to galactic calamity. Core Worlds Next in the importance for any Necron dynasty are the crown world, or core worlds, sorry, planets which together form the heart of a dynasty's interstellar territory. The rulers of the core worlds would inevitably be, uh, be the close kin to the region of their dynasty's crown world, ensuring a bond of dynasty loyalty or yet dynastic loyalty endured between the often diverse planets. Though neither so majestic nor so mighty as crown worlds, the core worlds were great, or were, yeah were great powers to be reckoned with in their heyday in a barring disaster or so again in the late 40s or 41st millennium my goodness fringe worlds finally necron fringe worlds are planets of a tertiary tertiary <laughs> importance to their ruling dynasty not viewed as being of high enough status to be numbered amongst the dynasty's core worlds. Fringe worlds were often poor or distant colonies of a dynasty, able to contribute to the wider realm only in terms of manual labor or as a location for penal institutions. Some fringe worlds were once or once have counted amongst the core worlds of a dy or different dynasty, but have since been conquered or otherwise subsumed into the dominion of their current ruler thus descending in status all right so now we're going to move to the biblical stuff and then we'll go right back to the warhammer stuff to the tomb roll activation but anyway so we're going to start with ezekiel 26 20 when i shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit with the people of old time and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in places desolate, or desolate of old, with them that go down into the pit, that thou be not inhabited. So this is a city, right? With people going down, entities, let's just say, going down into the earth. And I shall set glory in the land of the living. That's interesting right there. Okay. So now we're going to go Isaiah 14, what city is this talking about? That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? Now check this out. The golden city ceased. Okay, very interesting. We're going to get into what city that is, but not right now. Revelation 5.13. Now we're going to see that there's entities living under the earth. So Revelation 5, 5, 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, be ready, and under the earth. Kind of scary, isn't it? And such are in the sea, and all that are in them, 
heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, unto the Lamb forever and ever. All right. So now we're going to get into, I would say, kind of something that doesn't make sense in the King James Bible. But the Septuagint, I think, has a good translation for it. And I'll bring both here. So we'll go to the King James one. So Isaiah 13. The burden of Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amoz did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. So the gates of the nobles are these elites that have these portals, right? Which you're going to see here, like, you know, if... Anyways, I, I better read this. Okay. I have commanded my sanctified ones. This is where it doesn't really, it starts to not make sense. Okay. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. Now, the mighty ones also is a reference to the Nephilim as well. And to the giants. But anyways, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains. See, like, we don't live in the mountains, right? Let's say Christians and stuff like that, right? Nor do the angels in, you know, God's army, would say. Like as a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nation gathered together. Right? So, now what do we see in the day of the Lord? Now, I did a video if you want to know what the day of the Lord is. That's uh, like a week or two ago from this video, anyways. But it talks about how all the, you know, the kingdoms of the world come together, right? So this does, to me, I think this is kind of a mistranslation in the King James Bible. The Lord host musters the host of battle. See, now this is where it kind of gets it right, right? But anyways... This is the Septuagint here. Let's see what the Septuagint has to say here. Now this kind of makes more sense to me anyways. The vision of which Isaiah son of Amos saw against Babylon. Lift up the standard on the mountain of the plain. Exalt the voice to them. Beckon with the hand. Open the gates, ye rulers. You know, the nobles. Now, I give command and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath, rejoicing at the same time insulting. A voice of many no er, nations on the mountains. Very interesting. Even like that of many nations, a voice of kings and nations gathered together. The Lord of his hosts, or the Lord of hosts, has given command to a warlike nation. To come from a land afar off, from the uttermost foundation of heaven, right? And the Lord, his warriors, are coming to destroy all the world. So, this is a very interesting photo here. This is in Washington, D.C. So, you have that, not that hand, but this guy. Very interesting. Coming up out of the ground, right? Then you got this this guy here, right? There's the thumb, I do believe. So here's a close up of that guy. So very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Okay, not that one. Now we're gonna talk about the Raphaim. So before we get into that, I need to tell you what Raphaim means. Inhabitants of east of Jordan, but, here's the Strongs, right? Giant, Rapha, Raphaim is Rapha, from, or from Rapha in the sense of invigorating a giant, or healing, or reanimating. So let's go with Rapha, what does it mean? Become fresh. Completely healed, heal, healed, you know, healer, healing, heals, physician, physicians, purified, reappeared, repaired, 
and to take care. Very interesting. So, the word Raphaim is used in two different ways in Hebrew. It refers to the spirits of the departed dead who dwell in Sheol. It is a poetic description of the dead. It also refers to a strong, tall race of people who lived in Canaan. The second meaning of the word Raphaim is a literal meaning used to describe actual people who existed. Raphaim was not the description of a person's ethnicity, but rather a characteristic, right, that the people of the certain area shared. The word Raphaim means terrible ones, and they are described in the Bible as giants and mighty men, right, like we have here, like in the, where it says here, and I have also called my mighty ones, right? And then, I give command, bring them, giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. So, very interesting. Okay, the Raphaim, or Raphaites, appear first in battle with the king of Chattelomer, Genesis 14.5. Chattelomer and his allies defeated the Raphaim, along with the Zunzims and the, or, and the Emims, or Emim peoples. The Raphaim were similar to the Anakim. The Raph, or in Deuteronomy 2, 20 and 21, they are mentioned again in Exodus when the Israelites were trying to enter to the Promised Land. The Raphaim were living in Canaan. Now remember what Raphaim means, invigorating a giant, right? Reanimating. Okay, and the Israelites were terrified of it. The Israelites didn't want to go into the promised land because it was inhabited with giants. The sons of Anak, the spies came back to Israel and told the people that the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Just like the Necrons, right? And all the people that we saw in it are a great height. And there we saw the Nephilim the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem, ah, seem to them. So, very interesting. Okay. Now we're going to get into the city rising up again, right? Or the people of it, I should say. Revelation 17.8 the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So, I should bring this up. This is the Lucifer thing right here. Right? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weakest the nations? For how thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north. I will send above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. But ready for this? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Okay. Now this, now this is where the mainstream church kind of goes off here, right? Because it literally calls him a man right here. Okay. So they, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake the kingdoms. So who was that? Real quick. Before we get into this one. Let's go ahead. Do this one. So Poseidon. Poseidon was the Olympian god of the sea. Earthquakes. Floods. And drought and horses. There's also another interesting fact that I'll bring up here in a little bit. Okay, so now we saw that. The beast that thou sawest was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. With all these entities, right? Like the Necrons. So very interesting. Revelation 13.1 and I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. 
upon his horn or upon his horns ten crowns. This is pay attention to this ten, ten crowns part. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay. Revelation seventeen twelve. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Right? These are ten kings. Which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Check this out. Okay, let's go back here. Got to remember where it's at. Here we go. Okay. The Ten Kings of Atlantis. Poseidon and Cleito had five pairs of twins who, along with their descendants, ruled the ten provinces into which the Poseidon had divided Atlantis. The island and the ocean were called after Poseidon's firstborn, Atlas, who was the king over his brothers. The brothers and the descendants of their ten royal houses ruled over many other islands, and also over the Mediterranean peoples living west of Egypt and Tuscany. Interesting. The ten kings... Let's say that again. The ten kings who govern his own province are said to be are said to have assembled every fifth year and every sixth year, administering the public affairs and delivering judgment according to the law that Poseidon had in, or handed down to them, according to the records inscribed in a pillar of orac or oracalum or or oh my goodness oracalcum. Boy. Anyways, before I embarrass myself. So, we have these guys, right? And I stood upon the sand in the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Having seven heads and ten horns. Upon his horns ten crowns. Upon his heads the name of blasphemy, right? They're coming up. Out of the sea, out of the ground, all that. Okay. Now we're going to get back into the Warhammer stuff here. We're going to talk about the Tomb World activation. So hibernating deep within the hearts of their Tomb Worlds, the Necrons have been dormant for more than 60 million standard years. Scattered Necron raiding parties heralded the Undying Race's awakening to full activity once more in the late 41st millennium. But now as their thirsty star gods, the Catan, rise to a hungry wakefulness for life energy, the dreaded Necrontier have returned to claim the galaxy for their own. Every Necron tomb world has been constructed to accord to a complex template that was devised by the Necrontier at the height of their civilization. Utilizing physical principles and technology that have not been rediscovered by any other intelligent species since they began their long sleep, the Necrons created um, immense subterranean warehouses to store their race for the millions of years they would spend inactive. Using their mastery of advanced interdimensional geometry, the Necrons built massive chambers that could house ten tens of thousands of their kind in a space seemingly larger on the inside than without. Deep beneath these pyramidal structures, the Necrons stored their hor horrific weaponry and erected powerful temporal stabilizers that would shield these warriors and their savage weapons from the ravages of time, much like a stasis field. Each tomb world, once it has, or once it has been reactivated, awakens its sleepers in a rigid and predictable algorithmic sequence that is as inevitable as the dying of the stars. First, the tomb world releases swarms of robotic, canaptic scarab and canaptic spider constructs to attend to the rudimentary needs of the stasis tombs. Oh boy. Soon after the Nequan warriors are awakened, or reawakened, and begin reconnaissance patrols of the region of the world surrounding their tombs, using the information gained by these Necron warriors scouting missions. The Tomb World's automated systems assesses the current circumstances that dominate its environment. According to ancient pre 
predetermined algorithms. The stasis tombs then bring online other Necron machineries and weapons as, or as the circumstances warrant. The Necron Lord or the Lords present on the tomb world are encoded with this information and data necessary to form artificial personalities so that when they awaken, they can embody the singular purpose of the tomb world and make independent decisions. A large population um, center of one of the galaxy's younger races, usually mankind, may have been settled unwittingly on what is actually a Necron tomb world. When this situation is encountered, the Tomb World's encoded programming reacts extremely aggressive to defend its hibernating charges. These Tomb Worlds are the ones that have activated the most rapidly, or the most rapidly during the current awakening of the Necrons and are now hives of activity for the Undying Race. As their automated systems delve deeper into their existent, or existing archives, of data and storehouses of units and weapons. The tomb worlds whose areas of the influence have been invaded by the younger races are gearing up to begin what will eventually become a full-scale retaliatory action against the Imperium of Man and any other organized force that stands in the Necron's way. This is a programmed behavior pattern that Imperial savants have dubbed the Harvest. When it comes to pass, it will be a genocidal level event on par with the war in heaven against the old ones millions of years ago. So, very interesting. <laughs> kind of the same dichotomies here, right? Especially this last part. Right? But anyways, guys, that's the end of the video. Thank you guys for watching, and you guys have a wonderful day.